Hello, this is David Scherer. I'm here for the next episode in Physics 572, Introduction to Health Physics. Today, we're going to be talking about counting statistics. So without much more to ado, I'm going to share my screen and let's see if I can get the thing going. Share my screen and begin. And I hope everyone can see my uh, slides. Okay, so we're going to talk about counting statistics today. So um, I think it's obvious for some many people who work in radiation safety, but we have some people who've not been in this field before. So I'll just mention that radiation decay is a random process. Um, we, we don't have a, a regularly scheduled uh, uh, decay rate uh, for for th uh, these are not like soldiers marching in a line. Instead, it's a probabilistic uh, event, and and transformations take place uh, at a certain probability per unit time. But there's variation, and the 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 variation um, uh, can cause problems for for our measurements. So um, each nucleus in any given interval time dt has only two uh, outcomes. Either it undergoes decay or it doesn't. And so radioactive decay processes are sort of like, uh, are analogous uh, to a coin flip. Uh, because of that. Uh, and so uh, we have, uh, when, when radioactive material undergoes decay, it, it, it either, um, uh, each atom, either during some interval of time, small, short period of time, dt, either it undergoes decay or it doesn't. And so in that way, uh, the rate of decay process is similar to flipping a coin. When you flip a coin, either you get heads or you don't. Uh, and so you only have two possible outcomes. And that's true for radioactive decay as well. Um, and, and so there's a lot of statistics that, that have people have figured out about uh, how this works and, and what inferences we can make because of that. So when you have uh, when we flip a coin, the probability of heads is at one half. It's half heads and half tails, assuming it's a fair coin. Um, but when you flip a coin 10 times, you might get five. That, that would be the most uh, probable thing to happen. But you might get four heads, you might get six heads, you might get two heads, you might get eight heads. So it's possible they don't, that in any given sample of 10 coin flips, that you would get a different result. Another example of a binary process, so that, that's the case where, where the probability of, of a, a success or of an event is one half. There are other kinds of processes that are also binary, that are go, no go, where the probability isn't half and a half. So think about a dice, for example, a die, one, one die from a game. I guess dice means more than one. Um, so when you roll a die, it can have any value from one to six. Um, the probability of getting a, 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 a three, for example, uh, is not a half. The probability of a three is one sixth. And so you can have binary events, either a, 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 you get a three or you get something else. Uh, and those um, binary events uh, can, um, um, uh, that can have probabilities that are different than one half. With radioactive decay, the probabilities are, are are very small. There are, you know, a small fraction take takes place in a very uh, small fraction of, of nuclei decay in a very short period of time. Um, in fact, for something like uranium two thirty eight, uh, a very very small fraction decay per millisecond because um, half of them decay in four and a half billion years, so it's a very long time. Very few decay per second. Um, so, but the 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 math that describes these kinds of binary processes is called the binomial distribution. It's also called the Bernoulli distribution because the named after a, 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 a mathematician who worked on it. The probability you will have n events. So, in the case of the the coin flip, if you have four heads out of a thousand or four 
um, um, for the dice, four uh, number threes out of 10, um, is given by this formula where the large N is the number of trials, the number of coin flips, the number of times you roll the dice, and the small N is the number that match what you want. And so this is what the math of it looks like. This is called the binomial formula, binomial distribution. It's got some properties. We don't have to calculate this very often, so rest at ease. We use the, the statistical parameters more often than not. The, the, so it turns out that the average number of uh, 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 the average number of times that the number n will show up is p, whatever the probability of n showing up, times the number of events in a uh, Bernoulli equation. And then there's a, a measure of, of um, yeah, good. for those who were wondering, I, it did get recorded and saved, so I won't have to re-record the first lecture. Um, the, uh, uh, the variance is a measure of how much variability, uh, how, how, you know, how, how often will that particular number come up? And so the variance is just this P times one minus P times N. So there's one, one parameter, the probability. In the case of the dice, it's one sixth. In case of the coin flip, it's one half. And that one parameter tells us everything we need to know about the average and about the variance or the standard deviation. Standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. So the same parameter, just related to each other by the square root. Hi. Okay, um, the mean, uh, there are uh, three properties I just mentioned. I'm gonna go describe what they are. The mean, the variance, and the standard deviation. The mean is a measure of central tendency. It's the most likely thing to happen in your event. Um, the variance is a, a measure of dispersion. How many different results, how often you get different results. Um, and these are the formulas for the definitions of mean and variance. And the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. It's also a measure of dispersion. The, the units of mean are whatever you're counting, the number of coin flips, the number of decays, the number of, of dice rolls, or the value of the dice roll. The, the units of the square of the variance is square, the square of that. So um, we, the standard deviation has the same units as the mean. So it's uh, uh, a better reflection of how much the mean moves around, how much, how many, how much samples will be close to the mean, how far away they will be. Uh, but we can reach most of the conclusions we need just using these parameters rather than looking at the distribution itself. So let's go back to our, our Bernoulli equation, our Bernoulli distribution for, coin, for uh, rolling the dice. And let's figure out using that formula what is the probability of getting three ones in four rolls? Now, if you've read ahead in Stephen's book, he does uses this example as well. So the probability is it's the number of rolls divided by the number of successes times the difference of the number of failures. So the number of rolls is four, the number of successes is three, the number of failures is four minus three, which is one. Then you multiply by the probability of a success three times, so p cubed, p cubed, and then one minus p to the with, to the power of the number of failures. So the probability of actually getting three, exactly three ones uh, on four rolls, is about one and a half percent. Okay. Now we could do this again and calculate the probability of how many zeros. The probability of how many ones, probably how many twos, probably how many fours, fives, and sixes, right? Then we can calculate the mean by saying, what is the definition of mean? The number you had times the probability of that. So zero times the probability of zero, one times the probability of one, two times the probability of two, three times the probability of three, four times the probability of four, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, um, and plus five, plus six. I didn't include those on here. Um, and so we could do a lot of calculations, but to get this mean, which is what we're most often interested in, it's a lot easier to just multiply by the probability uh, of, of, of success times the number of, of events. So the probability, the, the, the average number of fours, or average number of ones in four rolls 
is 0.0667, uh, two thirds. Probably is one sixth. The number of, of trials is four. Four sixths is the same as two thirds. The variance, how much does that spread around? How often is it not match the, the average? Well, we can use just the, the P values and multiply them out. And there are four trials and it's a, a 0.5. So it's 0.667 plus or minus 0.555. Okay. It's a lot easier to do this than to calculate out all those probabilities. And so that's what we're going to do. We're not going to use probability density functions. We're just going to uh, use means and statistics. Okay. Now, another distribution I need to mention to you is the Poisson distribution. So in this, uh, when we did the, the uh, binomial distribution, the Bernoulli distribution, I talked to you about a number of events, right? Now, it doesn't say anything about how quickly those events took place. I can flip the coin at one a second, or I flip the coin at one every five minutes, and, and it was still the same distribution. The Poisson distribution has to do with rates in a time series. So it, it is uh, applicable for, to, for determining the number of events during a time interval when those events are random events, and they're binary events as well, okay? And this is the formula that Mr. Poisson came up with a long time ago. Um, we can get to this mathematically from the Bernoulli equation. If we take a very large value of n and a very small value of p, such that the, the product of n times p is a constant. n times p is a constant lambda. That's our new um uh parameter uh for the binomial equation and of course as we recall is the number of successes uh and and um lambda is now uh the the new parameter we have okay and we only have one parameter in the past we had p and we had q which is still one parameter now we have one a different a, a, a parameter that's that's equivalent. In this case, for the binomial equation, all we were interested in, or what we're most interested in, is what the mean and variance are. Well, the mean is equal to this parameter sigma, or lambda, excuse me, lambda, and the variance is also equal to lambda. So um, as long as we know what that lambda is, or if we can measure that one lambda, we can know everything we need to know. Okay. Now, the processes that we're talking about that are Poisson distributed are radioactive decay itself, but a lot of other things. Remember I said there's variation in the amplification that takes place in the um, gas detectors? That follows the Poisson distribution. There's variation in the number of electrodes that are passed from dyno to dyno in a photomultiplier tube. That's also a binomial distribution. So this distribution is very useful for us for a lot of, of uh, things that we worry about in radioactive decay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about statistics and parameters. I've already mentioned the, the parameters that we're interested in, the mean and the variance. When we do a sample, we the sample has a mean. That's a statistic. That's something we calculate based on the observations that we see. The parameter is something that, per, that uh, truly describes the population, not just the small sample. So the mean uh, of our sample is used to estimate the population uh, parameter, but it's not the same thing. We can get it wrong sometimes for because of statistical fluctuation. Same thing, the sample variance is a good uh, estimate of the population uh, uh, variance. These should not say pop, uh, pop. This should say the second bullet. These should not say sample. They should say population. Mu is the population mean. Sigma is the population variance. M and S are the the uh, sample mean and variance. Um, we use the, the, what we get from a sample to to estimate the the mean, but it, it may not be right. Um, so often, case I have a little picture that's supposed to be clever that shows us taking a sample, and we're going to use this sample to make inferences about the population, about the whole thing that we're sampling from, okay? That's to just draw the distinction. Um, 
so one more mathematical formula I have for you is a distribution called the Gaussian distribution or the normal distribution. It's very important for many, many things in life. It describes an enormous number of phenomena in the world and the number of whatever you're, you're interested in, that is, what, what the, the probability that the value you will see is n is equal to this formula where mu is the mean, the population mean, and sigma is the population standard deviation. This is a two-parameter uh, um, uh, uh, formula, right? It's got mu and sigma. In the past, mu and sigma were all related to a single parameter. And sometimes that will still be the case here. Um, the reason the, the, the normal distribution is so important is there's something called the central limit theorem that uh, tells us that if you collect samples, like I was just talking about doing our sampling, if you have a large number, say so you take a sample and you calculate the mean of whatever you're interested in from that. And then you take another cap, uh, sample and count the mean from that. Take another sample, count the mean from that. And then you look at the distribution of all those sample means, they will always be Gaussian. No matter what the underlying initial uh, distribution was, the, the sample will be, um, uh, the, the mean of the samples will be Gaussian, okay? And I've got a little uh, web page to show you. So this is, a, uh, we're gonna see uh, distributions that are uniform distribution. So we're gonna have dice. And for dice, the, the, they have equal probability that comes up one, two, three, four, five, or six. And so we're going to select five uh, samples. So there's one sample uh, of five. Uh, that's one sample. It has that value. That was the, the mean of it. Here's the next sample. So this is a sample size is five. Each time we have a sample is co consists of five. And it's it, on the lower graph, it's tracking what all the means are for each of our measurements. And so now it's going to do, I don't know, 10,000 samples. And so you can see that, that even though this was a flat distribution up here, the, when we get the samples, it means uh, that they end up being a Gaussian distribution, okay? Now I'm gonna go and, and use a larger sample, a sample size of 30. And we're going to get 10,000 of those. I want you to remember what that looked like, how, how, particularly how wide that distribution was before. So here's our 30. Here's our 30. We're going to do 10,000 of these samples as well. It's going to get faster. And... So you can see we're also getting a bell-shaped curve, right? But it's a much narrower bell-shaped curve, right? And before it was wide, it was spread out over the whole thing, right? Now let's go back to my uh, slides and we'll see why. Because in the central limit theorem, where is my central limit theorem? Uh, central limit theorem, the, the the distribution of those means of the different samples, then the uh, the mean of all the means will be equal to the underlying population mean. Okay. So whatever was on our our flat distribution, our nor our our uh, uniform distribution, the mean here is three and a half. That's the average if we look at just the overall distribution. The, the sample means, the mean of all the different samples is also three and a half. The variance of the sample of the sample means is the variance of the original distribution divided by the square root of the number. Or the variance is the variance divided by the number. The standard deviation is a standard deviation divided by the, the number. So the more samples you have, the more the bigger sample sizes you have, 
the 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 more peaked your distribution is around the mean. Okay, so this is a very valuable um, uh, uh, conclusion that's used in in medicine. It's used in agriculture. It's used in economics. Everything they use the central limit theorem. To, and in fact, one of your electives you can take in the in the course in the, the curriculum is a, a statistics class, uh, and, and you'll learn a lot more about it. Okay, um, in our case, there are two parameters in the Gaussian distribution, but our the, the mean of our samples will be the mean of the underlying population. For our Poisson distribution, the mean of the Gaussian will be lambda, that same parameter that was the mean for the Poisson distribution. The variance will also be, the variance is lambda divided by n. So the variance was lambda, the sigma squared is lambda, and so it's uh, lambda divided by n. The, the more, larger the sample is, the, the more closer it becomes to the true mean. The, the, the measured mean will be closer to the true mean. Okay, and here's the link to that thing I just showed you. Um, let's see. So what we're doing when we're taking individual measurements with rate activity is we're doing sampling. We're sampling a Poisson distribution. And if we do this over and over again, we get very close to the, the true value. Okay, once we, if we're using Gaussian statistics, we have a Gaussian distribution, we can do something called parametric statistics. So the, the Gaussian curve has been studied for centuries. People know a lot about the Gaussian curve. And one thing is for this parameter sigma, the square root of the variance, that within plus or minus one sigma, they know that 60% of the uh, results will occur there. And 95% will occur within two sigma. So how does that apply to counting? So uh, suppose we have some counting data and we, we, we count for some time, we get N samples. Well, then we can infer that the population mean, the actual true value is equal to that number of counts, okay? What's the variation? How accurate is it? How precise are we in getting close to that? That's the square root of the, the number of counts. So if we count 210 counts in say a one minute count, then at one standard deviation, 68% comp, uh, confidence limit, it's 210 plus or minus 14.5, okay? If we're, we want to know what it is within 95% accurate, it's 210 plus or minus 29, twice the standard deviation, okay? So that's why this statistics is useful to us. It tells us how precise we are. Now, let's, uh, this is, is, is all about uh, just doing some count and seeing how much variation there is in the count. Let's talk about it in terms of count rate. Often we're interested in the count rate. We want the number of decays per second or per minute, not the number of decays in whatever count time we chose. So the rate is the number divided by time. That's what our sample is going to be. Our, our estimate of the count of the decay rate is. The variation is going to be the square root of the number divided by time, which is the same as the count rate divided by time, square, the square root of all that. Okay. That's how much variation there is in our rate, in our decays per second, based on our radioactive measurement. Suppose we do 21 counts in one minute. Okay, that's what we measured. We did a one minute count, we got 21 counts. Well, what's the count rate, the K rate? It's 21 counts per minute. And what's the variation? Well, it's the square root of the count rate divided by the time, which is 4.6 counts per minute. So it's 21 plus or minus 4.6. What if we have the same count rate, 21 counts per minute, but we do 10 minute counts? Well, then we have 210 counts in 10 minutes. And what's the, the rate we measure? Well, it's 21 counts per minute, so that didn't change. But what's our variation? Well, it turns out that it's much less, it's 0.3 counts per minute. So it's much less. Uh, so by counting longer, we get a, um, a lower count rate, okay? Now, another thing that's important about uh, we can do with statistics is what's called inferential statistics. We can compare two different 
uh, uh, populations to see if they're different or not. And we can draw inferences about that. So for example, in the case of an environmental sample, we can take our soil or our air sample and we can count that and also count a blank sample that has never been used, never didn't sample any air and count that. Well, why would we wanna count a dummy sample, a blank sample? Well, we're not gonna get any radioactivity off it, it's clean. Well, the reason is because there's background radiation and there's noise in the instruments that can give us counts even if they're not real. And so we can see, is the sample that we took with our air sample or soil sample or whatever, does it, uh, is it statistically different from one that's never had any radioactivity? And so the, when the, the net count rate, the, the, the average value, the mean of, the, of the, the difference between the two is simply the difference of the two means. But the standard deviation has to include both standard deviations. The standard deviation of the net, the, the variance of the net is equal to the variance of, the, of each one added together. And so we have a formula here that shows what the standard deviation is. And I've got an example after this to show you. So suppose we have, um, a, a, we, we count a, a, a sample for 10 minutes and we have 2000 counts. We did our background and we, the count rate was, uh, we counted that for five minutes, we had 200 counts. What is our net rate? Well, the net rate is 200, 200, 2,000 counts divided by 10 minutes, divided by 200 counts, divided by five minutes, right? 200 counts in five minutes gives us 160 counts per minute, okay? Our standard deviation is this, it's 5.3 counts per minute, okay? So that's what our result would be reported as, 160 plus or minus 5.3 counts per minute. Um, it could also be reported as a range. This is a one standard deviation range. And so this is 68% confidence level. Double this number for a 95% confidence level. Triple it for 99.7%, et cetera. Now, did, when, we counted, when we divided this time, 10 minutes for the sample, five minutes for the background, was that optimal? Should we have chosen different numbers? Well, you, there, in the book, I think it's worked out, but you, there is a way to, to demonstrate. What we can do is we can take our standard deviation uh, and, and divide it by the sample time or the background time and take the derivative and optimize it. Set the, the, the derivative equal to zero, it gives us the, the maximum value. And it turns out the result is that the ratio of the sample to our background should be proportional to the square root of the count rates. Okay, that gives us optimal counting time. So from our previous example, what we should have done, we had 200 counts per minute, right? 200 counts per minute. And this was uh, 40 counts per minute, right? 200 divided by five, five times four is 20. Okay, our, our optimal ratio of counts is 2.23. Well, we did a count time ratio of two to one. So we're pretty close, pretty close to optimal. Okay, uh, but that's that's how you determine the optimal count rate. Uh, that's the formula that you use for dividing for low background count rates when, when they're approximately equal. Well, it's gonna be the same when they're not. The formula will be true anyway. So here's a graph showing this. Um, uh, just a nomogram, so that this is, I don't remember where it came from, but you can see that it's, it's a straightforward calculation to do. This is, shows you what that ratio looks like, okay? Um, now, uh, so let, now we, we figured out what our count rate is. We figured out what our certainty, our certainty our count rate is. So, but the count rate may not accurately reflect what the activity is. We already talked about geometry. Geometry uh, can, can decrease the, the number of, the, of uh, uh, events we see. When we were had a um, detector that was 15 centimeters away, I think it was, from the source, it was one and a half percent. We're only uh, uh, collecting 100, 100 percent. Uh, 
one and a half percent. So we can measure that efficiency directly. If we have a sample of known activity, we can count that sample of known activity and find out what percent that we're um, uh, uh, collecting. Um, th there are there is some loss when we're when we collect our sample and prepare it to be counted. So if we took soil, we had to do some chemical manipulations of the soil so it would uh, not absorb the radiation. Uh, there's an efficiency for that. That also fits into our, our formula. Um, so there's self-absorption. Some of the, the radiation that's being emitted will be absorbed in the sample itself. That's what the self-absorption factor is. Backscatter um, is, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll do this during your sample, uh, during your uh, uh, class uh, on campus with radiation instruments. It's uh, the amount of radiation that's lost because of, of uh, scatter from the, the detector back. Um, and so uh, all those things go into calculating what the actual ac activity would be. Um, th they scale up what our measurement is. Um, so let's say we have a detector with efficiency of 32%. So that's all these factors that go together all these extrinsic factors that uh, is 32%. Um, and we counted for 200 minutes. We had a, a total count of 3,000. And then we did a 200 minute background count. So the same amount of time. Uh, we had a count rate of 10 per minute. So what is our net count rate? Uh, and how what, what result would we report? So the count is uh, uh, shown here that we had 3,000 counts in 200 minutes. The background count rate was 10 counts per minute. So that gives us our, our net count rate is 5.25 counts per minute. What's our variation? Well, it's the count rate divided by the counting time. Add up both of them, and it turns out it's 0.36 counts per minute. Okay. Uh, so our activity is the reported activity divided by our efficiency is scaling up the um, what we actually observe to the actual value. That's 6.4 plus or minus 1.1 <clears throat> disintegrations per minute. The efficiency is counts per disintegration. Okay, so that gives us disintegrations per minute. We want to get it into units of per second instead of per minute. So we have to convert uh, the, um, the disintegrations per minute to get disintegrations per second we get 0.27 plus or minus 0.02 disintegrations per second or Becquerel. Now we're gonna convert that to Curie's. One Curie is 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerel. Uh, and then we're gonna actually make it peak Curie's. So 10 to the 12th peak Curie's and one Curie, we get 7.4 plus or minus 0.05 peak Curie's. Those are equivalent, okay? The, the difference, the, the ratio between it was always 37. So that's going to be here. So it's easier to calculate. Okay. Um, so that's an example of how you do these calculations. You might have to do uh, some kind of uh, calculation like this in your future. That's what I have for you today. I'd like to see what questions you guys might have for me now. And maybe it's too late and you're too tired to ask any questions. Okay. Well, I need to get homework back to you, as I said. Well, I'm going to uh, say goodbye and stop the recording, and then we can chat a little bit about it. So thank you all for paying attention. And have a good night.